Well, thank you very much for this very kind introduction. <clears throat> and if we could have uh, my slides, please. So what I, I will talk to you about tonight is how uh, we compare uh, intelligent uh, machines of two kinds. Uh, one is the biological intelligent machines, which generally is known as humans, and the other are the new artificial intelligent machines uh, that are designed by us at the moment. So we really have the contrast between evolution and design, and I won't call it intelligent design because that might be a bit controversial. Uh, so on the biological machine side, uh, you see that uh, really our intelligence is based on uh, our brain, and of course our brain is made out of neurons, so the bu basic building blocks of our intelligence and neurons, uh, they then uh, gather in large numbers, about a hundred uh, billion of them to make brains. Uh, we have ears to hear, eyes to see, legs to uh, wander around, we learn in schools. Uh, and uh, then I'll end up my talk uh, with uh, the sort of disruption uh, that technologies uh, cause and how this might uh, also have an effect on the chemical industry and then end up with uh, the point about human goals being really the leading uh, principle for coping with these artificial machines, where the uh, transistor is the equivalent of the neuron, the computer is a bit like a brain, microphones, of course, are the uh, <coughs> artificial equivalent of the ear, cameras, the eyes, robots uh, have legs, so I'll have a nice little uh, video on that. Uh, the sort of things that are achieved in schools is now achieved by machine learning. We'll talk a little bit about the business uh, aspects, uh, the business consequences of these disruptive technologies uh, that we'll see in cars and healthcare uh, and so on, and how evolution maybe will give uh, way to design in the future. So let's start with neurons versus transistors. The first thing to note is that neurons are, are a thousand times bigger than transistors. So we've managed to make transistors very small, about 20 nanometers, and neurons about 20 microns. Uh, they're rather faster, these transistors. They're actually, they're a million times faster than brains. So brains typically work at a kilohertz frequency uh, when we you know, really think very hard. Uh, but um, yeah, sometimes it's a little less fast. Uh, <clears throat> but computers can typically go at uh, gigahertz speed. Uh, we still have the edge in terms of the number of um, neurons in the brain, which is about 100 billion. Uh, the largest chips that we can produce has about a, a, a 10 billion transistors. Uh, but the real secret of uh, the brain, uh, which we haven't really uh, understood yet, is that every neuron, on average, has 1,000 to 10,000 connections. And it is the, the usefulness of this large number of connections of every neuron to 1,000 to 10,000 others uh, that we're now trying to understand with the uh, new machine learning techniques. Uh, now, we have the internet. We've got a billion hosts, and we'll soon have 20 billion Internet of Things connected. But, you know, there's still a big difference between a billion and a trillion like a factor of a thousand. Um, so let's look at um, neurons. Well, neurons are really quite complex things. So they're cells, so they have the whole machinery of a cell, you know, the nucleus, the ribosomes, they need to live. So all the sort of things that cells need to do in order to stay alive is also true for neurons. Then they collect all their inputs from these dendrites, and they're up to you know, 10,000, 1,000 to 10,000 of them. Then they add them all up to create a voltage in the soma here. And if the voltage exceeds a certain threshold, then they fire a signal, a very specific signal, which we'll talk about, a so-called spike, a neuronal spike, down the axon, which then fans out again in 1,000 to 10,000 uh, of these uh, synapses. And then there's another complexity that happens here because the electrical signal that arrives at the synapse that connects to the next neuron uh, actually doesn't 
traverse the synapse. There is a thing called a synaptic cleft where the electric signal is translated into a chemical signal. There are these little vesicles that then uh, traverse the a syn uh, a synaptic cleft to all these receptors on the other end, uh, on these dendrites. They then, in turn, cause the electric signal to go to the soma of the next neuron. In addition to that, these acts, although they are only about 20, nanometer, uh, 20 uh, microns big, these neurons, they can have rather long axons, like the one that goes from my brain to my big toe. So these axons are amazing things. Uh, and the reason why they have these sheaths around it is because it changes the electric environment for, for these spikes so that they can travel faster. So if I hit my toe, I know very quickly that something is not quite right in my toe because of these, uh, these very clever um, myelin sheaths. So, neurons have soma, dendrites, axon sheaths, synapses, uh, voltage-gated ion channels, which were first uh, studied by Hodgkin's uh, Huxley in Cambridge, and it's called the Hodgkin's uh, Huxley model. And this is the formula. Uh, that describes uh, neurons pretty well. So you've got the 1,000 to 10,000 inputs here. They get summed in the soma. And if the sum of all these inputs exceeds a certain threshold, it goes bang. <laughs> so it is digital in that sense. And these bangs, these little spikes, uh, are all the same size. They're all about uh, uh, you know, 60 millivolts high, and they're about a millisecond. Uh, wide. But although the individual spike is certainly digital because there is either a spike or no spike, there is nothing in between, so in that sense it's digital. But the frequency of these spike trains, as you see, is not um, digital in any way in the sense that the, the, the frequency looks you know, very, very analog, very um, distributed. So now let's now go to a transistor. A transistor is much simpler. In fact, a, a, a transistor is incredibly simple. Uh, it just has three parts, really. It has a source of the electrons, where the electrons come from. Then there's a drain, where the electrons are collected. And in the middle, there is normally a voltage gate that uh, determines whether these uh, electrons are going to make it from the source to the train or not. So it's an on or off, off switch. And that's it. All computing is is done with these uh, transistors. And we run them in this binary way uh, that, you know, it's either 5 volts, or now low, low voltages, in which case it's a 1, or it's no voltage, uh, in which case it's a 0, and you get these, these very regular clocks that look like that. Now this has led to a very, very simple uh, element that we call a NAND gate, uh, and here's see the truth table of a NAND gate. So only if both A and B are true. So if uh, A is one and B is one, do you get uh, an output here? But as it turns out, you can build any logical function using just NAND gates. So they're very, very fundamental and useful uh, building blocks. Uh, the problem with them is uh, that they don't just work in this binary form, but we also can approximate, uh, you know, analog waves more and more accurately the more of these digital uh, uh, digits you, um, uh, uh, you want to use. And this has seduced us to think uh, that the world can be described in this zero and one way, that statements are either true or they're false. And that turns out to be actually quite a poor way of describing the world. And as we'll see later on, the correct way of describing the world, which is much more powerful, is with probabilities, where things are never true, they're never false, they're just more or less likely. So how do we think? Well, we of course think with our brains, uh, and computers have these um, semiconductors, and this was this amazing chip that I found, which is only one gram, but it contains 512 gigabytes of memory. So since the brain is about a kilogram, uh, this uh, would translate into 500 
terabytes, which is a, an unbelievable amount of storage, and actually more than the storage in the brain. This is the biggest compute element that we're producing at the moment. This is a, a so-called GPU, a graphical processing unit, which is the fastest computer that we have uh, produced so far. So if we now compare the capacity of the brain, uh, it's very difficult to, to get an accurate um, uh, an accurate measure for how much uh, we can actually remember. But the, 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 the best estimates are between uh, 10 and 100 terabytes. So that's uh, 10 to the 12. But as we've just seen, if we just add up all these uh, chips, uh, these components that we had on the previous slide, uh, we can actually store five times as much uh, in a kilogram as a brain does. Uh, this is not true for our processing power. We are actually surprisingly clever. Uh, we are about a thousand times cleverer than the best computer that we have just in the, in the raw processing power that we have in our ability in particular to uh, process um, the, the world as it uh, appears in our eyes. So we're, we're really quite a clever lot. Uh, and, and this is the most impressive thing that biology does, is we do it very, very frugally uh, with just 20 watts. If we ha built a computer that was as powerful as our brain, we would consume 200 kilowatts, so 10,000 times more uh, than uh, our brain. And of course, it has these wonderful 100 uh, trillion connections. So the main difference, really, in the past has been uh, that computers work in this digital way uh, has sort of one processing unit uh, that everything has to go through, whereas the brain has 100 billion of these little processing elements called uh, neurons. Uh, so the, the big advantage of the brain is this massive parallelism, uh, where not just the compute elements are distributed all through the brain, uh, but the memory dis is distributed all through the brain as well. And the connectivity is sparse, uh, uh, and that seems to be the secret of how the brain works. But we're beginning to mimic this. So this is a, a picture of the brain. And this is the picture <coughs> of our latest new uh, microprocessor called uh, GraphCore, which simulates the human connectome. Uh, this is a picture of an actual brain uh, and the, all the connectivity in the brain produced by a uh, university west of, uh, of Cambridge, which is a perfectly good university, uh, and um, comes from, it uh, shows diff 200 different brain regions uh, from uh, 461 people. And this is the processor that tries to uh, be the new processor that is needed for machine learning. This is quite a, an unusual event. Uh, this has only happened twice before in the history of computing. Uh, so this is the third time that we feel uh, that computing needs a new microprocessor architecture. The first time, of course, it was the change from SIS to RISC, where we produced the ARM processor that's been quite uh, successful. It's in 95% of the phones that you use. The second time it was with the GPU, the graphical processing unit, because we needed a, sp a specific specialized processor to produce all the nice pictures and videos that are displayed on screens of a PC. And now uh, we're a bit stuck uh, with single processors because Moore's law has finished. Uh, we cannot make uh, processors go faster than about 3 gigahertz because there's this little problem with the speed of light uh, that we haven't managed to solve yet. So uh, 3 gigahertz it is. So the only way you can improve the performance of a computers nowadays is by parallelizing it and having lots and lots of processes work together a bit like the brain. This is hard because there's no generic solution of parallelizing a, uh, a, a general uh, piece of software. As it happens, uh, machine learning works on very large data sets. So there is a natural way of dividing that data set up into lots of smaller bits of that data set and then dedicate a processor to each of the smaller parts. So you can actually bring to bear, in this case, 7,000 processors 
uh, onto the single task, um, the single machine learning task. So this looks as if it's going to be the biggest chip in the world by the time it takes out, which will be in December. Uh, it has not just 7,000 processors, but also 650 megabytes of RAM. Now, those of you who remember uh, the BBC microcomputer, it had uh, a memory of 32 <coughs> kilobytes. So this was 10,000 times less than this single chip. So things have moved on in the semiconductor business since uh, those days. And it has a new, very clever uh, architecture called BSP, Bulk Synchronization Pro uh, Protocol, uh, where basically the, the computing cycle is separate from the communication cycle. Now, the reason why this is important to have lots of processes and lots of RAM is because if you can do the computation on the chip itself, it's 10 to 100 times faster than if you have to go off chip to find the, uh, the data and bring it on chip again. Uh, so it's very important that as much as you can will be done on chip. And these are actually uh, very interesting graphs that show how the different processes in that chip communicate with each other. So there's sort of local things where they all talk locally, and then uh, there's a, a little cluster here, and then they, uh, they talk across as well. And there's a wonderful uh, experiment going on called Spinnaker in Manchester with Steve Ferber, one of the two people who produced the ARM processor, and is actually using a million arms in a torus configuration to simulate a billion neurons in real time. It's a really exciting um, project. So let's look at our ears. We, of course, hear with our ears, and these artificial machines hear with their microphones. So how are, we, how are our ears doing compared uh, with the microphones? Well, not great, really. Uh, we hear sort of between uh, 20 and uh, uh, 20, uh, 20 hertz and 20 kilohertz, and of course uh, we now can actually go m much further down, probably just a few hertz, up to gigahertz. There are ultrasound uh, <coughs> microphones and ultrasound um, transmitters uh, that can go up to gigahertz. Um, these things can also. Uh, listen very well, uh, and we sort of max out at 120 decibels, after which uh, we go uh, completely um, deaf. Uh, but a Saturn V uh, rocket can actually produce 220 decibels, so you don't want to stand next to that. Uh, and we can also localize the sound very accurately to about 5 degrees, uh, which turns out to be very important because the next big thing happening in user interfaces, you've all lived through the uh, iPhone era, the iPhone is just 10 years old, and just the introduction of touch has changed the way we relate to computers. Well, this will change all again very rapidly over the next five years uh, because voice recognition has become so good so that you can talk to the computer. This only works because of beam-forming microphones. Otherwise, you'd have to have a microphone like I do uh, next to my lapel. But companies like uh, Amazon that produce the Amazon Echo uh, with software from a Cambridge company called DB, um, and Exmos, one of our companies, actually produces the best hardware solution for these beam-forming microphones. Now, the beam-forming microphones are important because what we do quite naturally without knowing is since we have two years, uh, if, uh, as I talk, you know where the sound is coming from. Uh, most of you are looking at me, which is very nice, uh, so you're not completely bored yet. Uh, and, but your ears now concentrate on where the sound is coming from, which of course is my mouth, which means that if somebody coughs or, or the air conditioning goes off, or so, you can lock all those sounds out because you know where the sound is coming from. That's called a beam-forming microphone. And in these products, the Echo has seven of these microphones at the top. It will find out where the speech is coming from and will be able to understand your speech across the room, as indeed they do. So it's a very important uh, change because people have been dreaming about talking to computers for a long time. Uh, it actually now works, uh, works very well. Uh, we see with our eyes, and of course, uh, uh, artificial intelligence is see with the uh, with cameras, 
And boy, are we losing that one. Where are we? Hmm. Okay. Well, there is a slide that just uh, show, com compares all the different things that we can do with the eyes. It's, it's just one that shows it in great detail. And then there's the frequencies that we can see. Uh, but as you can see, uh, the, the, the photons that uh, we can see in the, in the visible, uh, it's about from 400 nanometers to 700 nanometers, and it's, all, it's the blues to the reds, or the reds to the blues. Uh, it's the rainbow. And of course, we're very proud what we can see and very good what we, uh, what we can see. But look at the tiny window of what we can actually see compared with the number of electromagnetic waves that are out there from uh, you know, long waves, radio waves, microwaves, thermal, uh, infrared, uh, right up to the ultraviolet, the x-rays, and then uh, you actually <coughs> go to 10 to the 19 with these uh, gamma bursts uh, that are uh, amazing photons. And there's also the other problem. Maybe uh, one, one thing uh, also to just mention, because uh, when, when I did a bit of research on this, it was <laughs> so amazing, is the speed uh, with which we can see, you know, we can see, uh, again, in the sort of kilohertz uh, region. But there are now cameras that are so fast that when you switch on the light over there, say this is a scene that the camera uh, looks at, you switch on the light here, the camera, camera, camera will resolve the light as it travels across the scene. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, and the light, uh, the, 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 the speed of light is, uh, is very fast. <laughs> the other big difference is that we have two eyes. We're very proud of our two eyes. They allow us to see stereoscopically. But uh, these artificial machines have access to 100,000 cameras that are just web cameras all over the world. So the amount of information that they can take in from anywhere in the world, uh, you know, our two eyes, you know, you can put your glasses on, maybe you, you might have a, a telescope or something, uh, but, but you, you don't have 100,000 uh, webcams that are available to you. And this is important uh, because <coughs> with a number of cameras, uh, like in this car, we can solve the problem of autonomous driving. And uh, let me just give you an example of the fantastic amount of uh, cameras and stuff we have in these autonomous cars. So starting off uh, with radars for adaptive cruise control, uh, then uh, we have um, uh, the uh, LiDAR, this is a, a light-based uh, um, uh, distance and range-finding uh, technology for emergency braking, pedestrian detection, collision avoidance. Then we've got another lot of radar, uh, then we've got uh, uh, ultrasonics for parking, then we've got the whole thing off both sides and round the back. In addition to that, of course, we've got uh, all the cameras. I don't know whether we've got to um, see if this works. There we go. And here we have um, an example of how these self driving cars now uh, work. So we're inside the Tesla here.
servers. How does this work? Well, very recently, uh, machine learning has created a lot of excitement uh, because because of machine learning, when you've got good data sets, uh, uh, these convolutional neural networks, as they are called, uh, allow a computer to understand speech, for example, better than a human. So voice recognition, uh, computer's voice recognition is now better than human. Uh, but it also uh, was shown that it can see bet better than humans. Sorry, the object recognition is better than humans. So if you, uh, if you have a... Uh, you know, a cat or a dog or a, or, or a car here, uh, and this is the way it goes. It's like a neural network. So you first do this convolution that you, you take a, a small set of pixels and you, uh, you filter them out. Then you've got these, um, uh, these real uh, sessions which are, are uh, simplifying it, and you, it goes through a number of these layers, and there's a pool layer, a number of these layers uh, they can be up to a hundred deep, <clears throat> and at the end of it, it says, "Well, it's a car. <laughs> it's not a truck or an airplane or a ship or a horse. It's a car." Uh, and this is this this, of course, is a tricky problem, uh, but this is now uh, really working extremely well. Now, I want to show you what happens if you've got great freedom to design. Uh, your yeah, leg, we know a human leg, but a, a robot, of course, doesn't have the problem that it has to have a foot. It can have a, a wheel instead of the foot. And this is what it looks like when you've got a wheel at the bottom of the leg. This is a, a, an American company called Boston Dynamics. And it's really quite remarkable how well this thing works. Uh, <clears throat> as you see, it can do um, uh, little bends with its knees. I think it might do a pirouette in a moment. There you go. And uh, because you've got this design freedom when you start from scratch, because these things don't have to live, they don't have to give birth to its children, you just design uh, these things and make them in a factory, uh, they, can, they can do amazing things. But they can also do things quite differently from us. Uh, you know, you would never evolve uh, a wheel instead of a foot, and you never would pick up uh, a load like this. But, uh, you know, this makes sense. Um, amazingly, it can go downstairs without falling over, which is uh, surprising. But watch this. It comes to a, a snowy thing, and you'll see that it will slip in a moment. Here you go. And it didn't fall over. So the, the control... Um, loops that we now uh, have are, are really get, getting quite good. Uh, so we can jump up and down and it even can show emotion by jumping for joy. <laughs> so this design freedom of course can be very nice if you want to do this. So let's just go a little bit into more detail what uh, machine learning is and why this is such an important um, development. It was so important that um, the Science Industry and Translation Committee, which I co-chair at the Royal Society, decided to dedicate its first conference that we put together on machine learning. And uh, we then produced a report, which I all, uh, if, if, if any of you are interested in machine learning, it uh, is a report that was written by our uh, finest sci scientists in the country, and it's really a very readable report. But the definition that we uh, agreed on in this report is that it's systems that learn from data rather than following pre-programmed rules. So the interesting thing is that, as we'll see in a moment, uh, it, is not, it is no longer deterministic because it's not rule-based, so the programmer doesn't determine everything that's happening in the system. But it takes its clues from the data sets, from what actually happens out there uh, in the world. And by doing that, and doing it probabilistically, uh, as it happens, it has become the most powerful tool that mankind has so far produced. There are different branches of uh, increasing uh, difficulty in machine learning, called supervised, where you 
have to label the data. So if you've got lots of pictures of people, you say this is John and this is Daisy and this is uh, Herman. The unsupervised ones have no labels, so you just group them together <coughs> into uh, faces that look a bit like it might be the same person. And then uh, you've got to add the labels later on. Reinforcement learning is an interesting one that uh, became very famous and successful uh, when uh, you try to win a game because in reinforcement learning the reward is so clearly defined. You know, you get a higher score in a game or you win the game of chess or the game of Go. Uh, so uh, this is still comparatively tractable. The, uh, the most sophisticated uh, machine learning environment that we've created is called inverse reinforcement learning where you don't know what the score is. You don't know what you're trying to achieve, but you can watch other people do it. So you, you basically watch people's behavior and deduce from the behavior what, they were, what they're trying to do, what their intent is, what their um, reward function is. So some examples, so speech recognition I already mentioned, which is spectacularly good now, both with the um, OK Google command or Siri or uh, uh, Alexa that I'm sure many of you have played with. Object and face recognition is now better than, uh, than human. And those of you that have played with Google Photos, I'm, I'm always amazed how it finds uh, you know, my, my relatives in, in the photos, even if they are not very sharp. And there are these recommender systems. So if you use Netflix or Amazon uh, Prime, uh, it will suggest uh, a film that you might like, and sometimes you do. If there is one slide that I'd like you to remember uh, from this talk, it's this one. So it's slightly involved, but let me assure you it's important. <laughs> it's this point about the world not being made out of zeros and ones. You know, we. Everybody knows that the computer has binary systems. Uh, we've gotten very comfortable with that. Everything is in zeros and ones. And as I said earlier on, this seduced us into thinking uh, that we can describe the world quite well by making statements that are either true or false. You know, something is big or something is red or something is uh, costs a hundred pounds or something. And uh, you think that you can uh, give an answer to this question. You can say, well, this person is big, or this person uh, wears a red jack jacket. And it's sort of seductive that you say, well, it's either true or it's false. As it turns out, uh, there is a much more powerful way of describing that, and that is a, with a probability. You know, if you see one of these basketball players, and he's uh, sort of seven foot uh, five or something, most people would agree that he, he is tall. So you will give it a pretty high probability, you know, because there's no... But most people aren't seven foot five. They're, they're sort of tallish. Uh, and uh, if you say, well, he's sort of, you know, 85% tall, this turns out to be a much subtler and better way of describing people's heights than just categorizing it into tall or, or small people. And this turns out to be very powerful. So the basic concept that we've got to get comfortable with is not truth and falsehood, falsehood but probabilities. So, because that's the best way of describing the world. Now, what do we give up? We give up determinism. So uh, the nice thing about things being truth or false, you can then do these if-then statements. So you can say, well, if um, uh, all humans are mortal, Socrates is uh, human, therefore poor chap is going to die. Uh, and this is very seductive, makes a lot of sense, uh, but it turns out it is better if you describe it in probabilities. So you give up the determinism because everything is statistical. Now, we haven't come across uh, people that haven't uh, died yet, except for the ones in this room, of course. So we haven't yet, and there are some people that believe that maybe one day uh, we will fix this uh, problem of uh, dying and we'll live forever. So. Uh, just because this might just be possible, it's better to assign it a minute probability. Uh, certainly not uh, this year, but um, sometime in the future that might be possible. 
Uh, we, the, the thing that we gain is that we don't have to program anymore. Now we've got to program a bit, but most of the value of these machine learning uh, environments come from teaching, uh, from providing the right uh, training data sets uh, to the computer, and the computer will then figure out itself from the training data set what the sensible thing to do is. But it does need a lot of data. It needs big data. They're quite data hungry, these machine learning programs. Now, the big problem with this slide is uh, that what is it all for? You know, why should a computer do what it's doing? And there is this big, this big uh, conflict because, of course, we'd like these uh, <coughs> artificial intelligent machines to do something uh, that fits in with our lives. We want to give them human goals, but it is not clear how we do this. So this might well be... Uh, one of the biggest problems over the next uh, few decades. Uh, I call it the genie problem because we're actually very bad at wishing for the right thing. So a few words on artificial intelligence. Uh, my neighbor Steve Hawkins said that the uh, success in creating AI would be the biggest event in human history. Unfortunately, it might also be the last. Whoop, this was a mistake. Uh, Oh, here he comes again. Uh, and Elon Musk, who is the sort of new uh, Steve Jobs in uh, Silicon Valley, said, hope we're not just the biological bootloader for digital superintelligence. Unfortunately, that is increasingly, increasingly probable. Uh, a new book has just come out called Life 3.0 by Max Tegmark, who is a physicist at MIT, a, a, a prof who thinks quite a bit about the uh, AI, uh, the artificial intelligence problem and machine learning problem. And it's a very interesting concept because he says life one, uh, he, he sort of divides life into a hardware component and a software component, where the hardware, of course, is our bodies and the software is our culture and uh, all the sort of things that we can do uh, when we think we're smart. Uh, so uh, life one dot is the sort of nematode worm uh, that can evolve its hardware only through evolution. So it, but it can also only evolve its behavior through evolution. It can't teach its, uh, its offspring where the better place is to find food, etc. Uh, but that's life to dodo. That's us. Uh, you know, we, we can uh, change our bodies at the moment only through evolution, through um, lots of generations that we've lived through in the past. But we have a culture, so we, we teach our kids how to speak in different languages and so on. And Life 3.0 is just around the corner now that we take control of our bodies as well because we can now design genes uh, and synthetic biology is, is probably uh, one of the most exciting and also a scary new disciplines uh, that is going to make an impact on our health system in the next five to ten years. There are these uh, famous, uh, there's this famous event uh, that happened uh, in March 2016, it's over a year, that uh, Demis Hassabis, who is also uh, one of our computer science graduates in Cambridge, uh, uh, wrote this program at uh, Google DeepMind that beat the best player, Lisa Dahl, in Korea. Why is this important? Well, until uh, Demis devised this uh, uh, really a very clever program called AlphaGo. All the goal play, all the Go uh, playing uh, programs were actually very poor Go players. And the reason for that is that Go is uh, very much more complex than chess. Chess is actually quite an easy game compared with, with Go because Go is played on a 19 by 19 grid uh, so there are actually more configurations of these stones than there are atoms in the universe. It is incredibly complex. So there's no chance in hell of writing a program uh, that could react to uh, all these different uh, combinations. So that's why all the programs, all the Go programs were very poor until machine learning came along. And the way this was done was with reinforcement learning and uh, it started off with a mediocre Go program, but then it played itself 30 million times and learned from every game. And that uh, was a great success, but the unexpected thing happened in move 37 in game two. 
So uh, go one, uh, alpha go one, four to one. Now normally, uh, do we have any go players in the, in the audience? Go players? Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so I, I, I spent a bit of my time, I wasted a lot of my time when I did uh, physics at Cambridge playing go when I should have done my homework. Uh, and <laughs> so you normally play on uh, line three uh, in the early part of the game if you want to control the side of the, the board and line four uh, when you try to control the center of the board. And this game, 37, was uh, played on line five in, in the first game. And this was such an outrageous move uh, that Lisa Doll got up and walked around for 15 minutes. And he couldn't make up his mind whether this was a bug in the program <laughs> or it was an ingenious move. And it turned out to be an ingenious move. In fact, so ingenious uh, that the Go community, and there are about 40 million people uh, in the world uh, playing Go, uh, felt that this was uh, a move that showed intuition, that showed imagination, so things that are not normally associated with uh, computers. Uh, they assigned this sort of human qualities. Now, to <coughs> humanities, great satisfaction. There was an equally brilliant move by, by Lisa Dahl, uh, move 78 in game form, which won him the only game that he, he won. So there's hope for us yet. Yeah. There's a bit of history of AI, but let's not uh, go into that. Let's uh, just look at the disruption. Um, Arm is uh, uh, this successful company that we uh, started in Cambridge that produces microprocessors. And uh, it was quite a nice design, uh, changing from the Intel CISC model, the complex instruction set computer, to the RISC model, the reduced instruction set computer, and therefore lowered the power consumption of microprocessors. And that's one of the reasons why it was successful. But the bit that I want to talk about today is not uh, the better design, but the change in the business model that caused a disruption in the industry. Uh, so Intel, uh, and this has to do with the value stack. So Intel has the intellectual property. They design uh, the processor like ARM does. Uh, uh, and uh, so that's the second thing. But that it then also manufactures it. Whereas ARM chose the licensing model. And because we have the licensing model, uh, we managed to license this design to TSMC, that's the Taiwanese uh, semiconductor, uh, corporation, which is the second largest uh, semiconductor company in the world, plus 450 others. And that's why ARM managed to become more or less a monopoly with a 95% market share in mobile phones. And Intel is nowhere in mobile phones. Uh, and it's quite a <coughs> remarkable achievement for a little uh, Cambridge company. And we've now shipped over 100 billion uh, arms. So this is about... Um, 10, 10 for every single person on earth. So you might ask, well, where is my 10? And the answer is in your smartphone, because an average good smartphone has 20 arms in, in them. It's not just the main processor, because, but it's also the arm in the USB, the arm in the Bluetooth, the arm in the Wi-Fi, uh, and lots of other uh, things. It was sold for 30 billion last year to SoftBank, and we're outselling Intel 20 to 1. So Intel really is a, a niche player in, in uh, microprocessors compared with us. Uh, and it has to do with for, uh, two reasons for that. One is the low power design, which of course is perfect for uh, the Internet of Things and mobile phones, and the other is uh, this licensing model. I give a different talk uh, at times called uh, The Six Waves of Computing, where I show that so far six times there have been waves where people dominated a particular wave and every time the dominant uh, company misses the next wave. The last time this happened was uh, with PC. The PC, company, uh, the PC wave is completely dominated by Intel and Microsoft. Neither of them have any market share in mobile phones. It is really surprising that they miss it every time. I thought this was peculiar to the computer industry. I now believe this happens in all industries and it's happening big time in the car industry. They've got two of these disruptions coming at the same time, which happens rarely. One is the minor disruption, which is the electrification. 
The much bigger disruption is uh, the disruption of autonomous driving because it's not just a technical disruption, it is also one that disrupts the <coughs> business model. So let's look at why it disrupts the business model. It disrupts the business model because it changes what the customer does. So the customer at the moment goes into a showroom, picks up a BMW, a Tesla, a, a Jaguar by looking at whether it's a beautiful car, the horsepower, the petrol consumption, uh, the price, and then spends you know, tens of thousands of pounds on buying a new car. In the new world with machine learning and uh, with this world of transport as a service where you don't own a car, you make a, a £10 decision between getting up in the restaurant and walking out of the restaurant on whether you go, go with Uber or 5AI, which is the, uh, the company that wants to produce the first uh, um, autonomous driving service in London. And the people here, the car manufacturers, become mere component suppliers for the service companies. So they are in real, there's a, there's a real disruption happening here. Uh, and a similar thing is happening in healthcare, where we move away from treating ill people to keeping people healthy. This 70-30 thing will change to 50-50 in sort of five to 10 years, and that's a, a trillion dollars that shifts there. So this is the single biggest opportunity I know of. And again, it's a, a change from uh, treating the patients by making sure that they never become patients in the first place. So let me just uh, uh, make this point about Life 3.0 again. Uh, you know, we've reached, a, I'm sure you've seen the, the, this, the, the, these sort of pictures before, but now uh, we don't naturally select people anymore because we've got uh, so much control over, over our environment uh, that uh, this is not the way evolution works anymore. What we really have is because of Aristotle and uh, Bayes and Alan Turing, we now have robots. And so my conclusion is that we have a new partner. And these are these artificial intelligent machines. And hopefully we can co-evolve with them peacefully. But there are lots of people who paint very dystopian futures that this might all end <coughs> terribly with them. Um, Schwarzenegger uh, type uh, uh, machines uh, killing us all, uh, but there are equally plausible utopian futures uh, where we will all live happily ever after with the robots. So, so I'll stop here. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, we've got some time now for questions, if anybody like to start off. Perhaps I could ask the, uh, it kind of follows on your last slide really, um, to what impact do you think um, society at large will be accepting of these changes? I mean, it's all terribly exciting. Yes. You know, once people start losing jobs and yes. Yes. so on. Yes, well, I, I was uh, in Japan, now, I'm on a number of these panels on, on these issues, and of course this question always comes up on how we relate to robots and whether they're good, uh, good things or nice things or bad things. And the interesting thing in Japan is they love robots because there are lots of stories. I, I, as you probably know, the Japanese society is, is quite an old society and an aging society. And one of the main uses that they believe robots will have is actually help the elderly. And of course, they're always there. They're always patient. They never get irritated. Uh, you know, so, so there's something to say for robots for, uh, for old uh, old people. So I found, uh, and we also had lots of artists, people from the humanities that we normally have on panels here as well. Again, their attitude was completely different from the attitudes that I normally uh, find in, in, in Europe, a bit less so in the US, uh, where the people in the humanities have this great fear that the robots will take over or they will create lots of, uh, uh, make lots of people redundant and, and encroach in their, into their sphere. Whereas the Jap Japanese, they're all looking forward to uh, <clears throat> having more tools to express themselves. So the artists were, were quite keen to have these new machine learning abilities because they felt they had a bigger palette of opportunities uh, uh, to work with. Um, 
Uh, one uh, last point on the uh, unemployment uh, situation. This, of course, is not going to be the first time that we have these disruptions. We've had these technology disruptions many times, start, starting with, uh, uh, with the uh, um, mechanical loom. So far, it has always been the case that we've created more new jobs than we've, than we've uh, destroyed all jobs. Unfortunately, it's not for the same people, of course. Now, in the case of the miners, uh, this was quite a serious problem because it's very difficult to retrain a miner into one of those modern jobs. But the jobs that people have now are actually much more retrainable than the ones that we had uh, before. So we hope uh, that this uh, will not be as big a problem as some people uh, make out. But we don't know, because one of the things that is true is that these changes will happen much faster than they ever happened before. Yes, yeah, so, um, question at the back. Could we have the microphone, please? I'll, one there. I've got quite one there. Voices, no, no, we, we need the microphone, please. Remember our friends in Aberdeen. <laughs> um, yeah, my question really is about uh, data sets, and um, particularly looking at something like the uh, opportunity around health. Uh, do you think we're going to be able to get uh, access to the right sort of databases? Well, we're actually in a, in a very good uh, place here in the UK because the NHS database is actually one of the best databases in the world. Now, we've got to be very careful about uh, protecting people's privacy on the data, but there are now perfectly good mathematical techniques to anonymize uh, the data. Uh, and uh, the, the power of machine learning extracting really good information about the likelihood and the, and the treatment, the likelihood that a person develops a certain condition and the way to treat them. Uh, this is a fantastic opportunity and really one of the biggest uh, uh, positive applications of, of machine learning. So I'm very excited about that. And there's some early results that, that show that. A question there. Could you wait for the microphone, please? Yeah. Here. Hi, good evening. Um, my question is uh, about um, the new capacities of uh, store information in DNA or, or um, quantum, for instance, in quantum computers, how, how, how all of these things fit in, in, in your talk, because you, you didn't mention any yes. of this. Yes, so I, uh, there are three <coughs> disruptive technologies that I'm particularly interested in because of the short-term consequences of these uh, three technologies. One is machine learning that I talked about a lot. The other is the blockchain and smart contracts because it allows us to automate business processes. And a good example is uh, Merck's, who is the biggest container company in the world. They spend eight cents to actually transport uh, uh, the goods, but they spend 20 cents on the paperwork that goes with, uh, uh, with the transport. So they are going to use the blockchain and smart contracts to automate that. So it can really help us uh, with the productivity, which is actually one of the really critical problems <coughs> in Britain in particular. Britain is very bad at productivity increases. And it's only productivity which can increase the, the living standard in a country. So productivity is very important. Uh, so machine learning, a blockchain, and smart contracts, and the third is synthetic biology. So. Uh, uh, the most exciting company that I have at the moment is a Cambridge company called Evonetics, uh, which uh, tries to revolutionize gene synthesis. And if you can create the genes from scratch, uh, you're basically controlling uh, life itself. And this opens up tremendous opportunities in healthcare. And you can fix things that, you know, inherited diseases, uh, virus, uh, um, uh, illness is called by viruses, and so on and so on. So, so, and these are really very, very fundamental, very deep technology uh, changes uh, that, uh, that, as I said, will have you know a significant impact on our lives within the next three, uh, within the next five to ten years, not twenty to thirty years. One here, please. Thank you. 
Um, my question revolves around the professions. So um, with the increasing capability of machines um, coming into play, how will that affect the professions that we see today? So accountancy, law, all of these big information systems, how are machines going to disrupt that sector? Yes, well, they will be very disruptive. And of course, uh, <clears throat> many of us were um, looking forward to making many of these lawyers, uh, you know, redundant. <laughs> uh, <coughs> the, um, and this is, of course, one of the story that goes around. But if you act, actually look at uh, what, what lawyers like doing, they, aren't, they, they actually like doing the, uh, the drudgery of going through lots and lots of documents all the time. They'd love to have that automated so that they can do the bits uh, that uh, are the clever bits that lawyers do. They really have got to think about how you know, people want to relate to each other and what, what, what they actually want to have reflected in their contracts. So <clears throat> the hope is that this will make us a lot pr more productive and we'll actually end up with better contracts faster uh, than before. Uh, but um, as somebody rightly said, it's very difficult to make uh, predictions, especially about the future. <laughs> yeah, uh, three there. Could we have the lady on the left first and then right at the back and then the guy? Thank you. Could you tell me what you think about um, self-drive cars, whether they're okay for our towns or would they be of benefit for motorway driving? Do you have an opinion on that, please? Yes. Well, I think they're wonderful. Uh, <clears throat> and they're wonderful. Uh, uh, the first reason why they're wonderful is because it is quite likely uh, that they will reduce uh, accidents by a, a spectacular amount, maybe 90%. Uh, now, the reason for that is not that they are particularly clever, but the, uh, the bar of being better than a human driver is actually not very high. <laughs> uh, the autonomous driving uh, industry uh, distinguishes between five levels. Uh, level five, like in the company that I mentioned, 5AI, is where you don't have a steering wheel anymore or pedals because the car just, just drives you and you don't need to ever do anything and it drives you anywhere. Uh, the way it will start off, and this is just around the corner, maybe just uh, one or two years, is with trucks and motorways, where, so, where the, the, the driver drives the truck onto the motorway uh, and sends it the next 500 miles all by itself and then uh, the car goes into a labor and the other trucker picks it up again, you know, in Edinburgh or somewhere and then drives it through, through town or through country lanes where it, it can't do it yet. So this is the first application is, is motorway driving. And Tesla, for example, provides that now. So you, you, on an American highway, you can go get into uh, your Tesla, drive it onto the motorway and then sit back and it will drive itself as you saw uh, in, in the video. Driving down Oxford Street is a different matter uh, because this now becomes uh, quite a cultural thing as well because apart from the car and the other cars and the taxis and the buses and the bicycles and the motor scooters and the pedestrians that cross when they shouldn't, uh, you know, you actually have to track about 50 different objects. And what we do so well as humans, uh, when we look at uh, Locato, although we didn't have any cameras in the back of our heads, uh, we, uh, we sort of scan what goes on. And if you see a guy sort of walking like this, you think, oh, you better watch out for this one. He might fall onto the street. Uh, and we pick this up in absolutely no time. So getting a computer to recognize uh, these behaviors and make the, the right predictions of what these 50 different objects will do next uh, this is tricky, and I think it will take maybe five years or so, but not ten years. And then we'll have it in the city. Could I just ask if there's anybody in uh, Aberdeen with a question to um, let whoever's with you know, and we'll confirm the, the, the question through to here. Yes, please. Uh, yeah, um, I would be very <coughs> interested to hear what you... Uh, might have to say about sustainability in the future, i.e., you know, we have all these machines, they need the energy, we need our food if we live longer and we, you know, uh, populate 
uh, the planet more. I mean, I don't want to become morbid and say I don't want this. Um, but when, when it comes to sustainability, what's the perspective? What, how, how will that be affected? Well, uh, uh, it should have a very positive e uh, effect on sustainability because of the productivity increases. So uh, just take um, you know, the traffic uh, uh, example. The way a human drives is actually quite stupid. <laughs> you know, we accelerate all the time when we shouldn't, and then we brake hard. Uh, if you know where the other cars is, uh, our cars are, as you would in a, uh, in a in an automated environment, you would never accelerate more than you absolutely need to, uh, and you will you will brake a lot less, so you save a lot of energy that way. You will always pick the optimum route so you wouldn't go as humans do because they know well if I go to Piccadilly Circus and then hang a left I know I can end up in Regent Park but you might find a you know a much safer a, a much shorter and lower energy route so there are lots of efficiencies uh, uh, that way to be had the uh, the problem is a um, complexity problem. So one of the very interesting, uh, exciting new uh, tools that we have come from complexity theory, that you take very complex uh, networks of, uh, of things that interact, you know, both human and, and, and machines. And the techniques are getting now good enough so that you can optimize these uh, uh, networks for particular results. And that's why I made this point in my key slide that the, the most difficult decision that we will have to take as humans is to choose these goals. You know, what is most important to us? Is it most important that we make sure we don't heat up the, uh, uh, the planet to us? Is it most important that we, uh, you know, have lots of fancy food or, uh, you know, are we going to go for healthy food? Uh, are we going to go for more a vegetarian uh, diet and therefore we don't need to feed all these cows that uh, uh, you know are much more expensive than the, uh, than the vegetables? But these all become then explicit goals that we as mankind have to make decisions on. And I'm a little worried about that because we're so bad at it. <laughs> we have a question from Aberdeen, I believe. Yeah. Um, so I've just received this uh, from Dr. Rhino Abel at, um, at the University of Aberdeen. He asks, if two automatically driven cars meet on a single track road, which one will reverse? <laughs> <laughs> it's an excellent question, and it shows up the cultural differences of different countries. This is also the problem of the, uh, the crossing with four stop signs. Because if you've got four stop signs in an, uh, four cars, which one goes first? And somehow humans solve this because uh, you don't get many four stop signs where, with four dead people because they couldn't decide on, on, uh, on who's going to move first. So, uh, and this is why it is likely that the software uh, for autonomous cars in Britain will be different from the one in Italy. And, uh, <laughs> But the, the final answer to this particular uh, problem is, uh, of, of, of who backs up first is it's going to be random. <laughs> random, you know, the, the final solution to all these are genuine um, random number generators. And uh, that's actually one of the interesting uh, results of new quantum computers. You, you can have, if you have quantum qubits, you can produce genuinely random quantum uh, uh, numbers and that so, so there's a, a pack of physics solution to the random number generation problem. One, one gentleman there. Now this question is prompted by your machine and brain comparisons. Do you see a future in linking the two electronically so that an individual can improve or augment brain performance? Like maybe just playing better tennis to begin with but the sky's the limit perhaps. Yes, uh, yes and there are lots of experiments uh, uh, along those lines and it actually is quite possible to um, grow nerve cells along uh, silicon chips and interact and, and, and interface them. Uh, 
in order to deal with 100 billion, we still have a big problem because I think we can do it maybe a few hundred or so. so uh, the, the bandwidth isn't, isn't great. But I do believe in that, in that co-evolution that might also be uh, physical. So the way, peop- the way we might become smarter I- in the future uh, could take different paths. One is the incorporation of uh, a more immediate um, uh, interface to computers. And I believe this makes sense, especially when it comes to memory, because as I said, there's lots of it and it's actually very reliable You know, with this error correction thing. It's, it's better than, than certainly my memory uh, now. But the other is uh, we can also improve uh, our biological system uh, genetically. Uh, people are very afraid of that uh, because uh, of the sort of designer babies and all that. But uh, uh, we will start off dealing with lots of uh, illnesses like dementia and uh, you know, Alzheimer's and all, all that. And I think this will have a very positive effect. So it's both. Okay. One more of there, please. This might have to be the last question. Dr. Hauser, do you envisage a time when a, a machine might develop characteristics such as uh, emotions, ambitions, and decide that, well, maybe this world would be better off without you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is, of course, uh, always. Uh, one of the dangers, and this might might well happen. Uh, I hope not. Um, <clears throat> but uh, we're really getting on to the uh, domain of beliefs. Now, my belief is uh, that there is nothing a human can do or feel or art or music or, or anything that we believe is very human that a computer will not be able to do in the future. And the reason why I believe this is because uh, I believe that brains basically obey the normal physics and chemistry uh, that, uh, that we know. And if you believe that we cannot simulate it and we cannot reproduce it uh, in a computer, you basically believe in a sort of, um, you know, vis vitalis or something or, or some, some uh, sort of supernatural thing. And, uh, you know, being a scientist, I'm just not comfortable taking that step. So I, I do believe that eventually they will be able to do uh, everything and sadly uh, they'll probably be doing it a lot better than we are. I think that's probably all we have time for. Um, I'd just like to um, close the proceedings as it were by presenting Dr. Hauser with this uh, uh, certificate from SCI with the SCI seal on uh, commemorating this great lecture. Thank you very much indeed. Oh, thank you.